starting a recording. Go ahead. Danny, we'll get back to you, Danny. Okay. Go ahead, Jacob. Okay. Uh, let me get the presentations. Uh, share screen now, right? Yep. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yep. So, hello, my name is Jacob Morgan. I am part of Eastern Michigan University's NEBP engineering track team. Uh, this is the first time EMU has been a part of NEBP, so we're very excited to share our observations and experience at the annual solar eclipse. And with that, uh, let's get started. So to give a quick recap on what happened, um, our balloon seemed to be ascending at a very fast rate, faster than we normally anticipate. Uh, our ventilation system also seemed to be unresponsive. And with those two things combined, uh, our balloon ended up bursting and falling back down to earth before totality, unfortunately. Um, once we did recover the balloon, it was found to be pretty tangled up and mangled up. And so in this short presentation, we just wanna to try to answer the following three questions as to what the heck caused our balloon to go up so fast, uh, what does the data suggest, and theories of the wreckage, and what can we do to improve? So first, um, starting off from the data that we were able to salvage, um, this graph was made by the Iridium's tracking data and is plotted as altitude in meters versus vertical velocity in meters per second. Uh, notice that around the 15,000 meter mark, our vertical velocity actually gets a bump or an increase before leveling back down to around the 24,000 meter mark. Now, it's very speculative on what actually caused this uh, bump in vertical velocity, but we know that it did happen around the top of the troposphere. And if we look to the right, uh, this is a graph made by the National Weather Service's balloon data uh, gathered the same morning as the annual solar eclipse. This was re retrieved by our professor of meteorology, uh, Dr. Thomas Kovacs. Shout out Dr. Kovacs if you're here listening. Um, he walked me through this graph and pretty much if we follow this right black line uh, or this black line to the right, uh, this is actually measuring the temperature as the balloon increases in altitude. And as soon as that temperature stops decreasing at around the 16,000 meter mark, I know the numbers are kind of slow, but I believe it's around the 15, 16,000 meter mark the temperature starts to increase. So we know that's where we're meeting uh, the tropal uh, pause in the stratosphere. And as we look back at our iridium, that is where we're increasing in vertical velocity. We speculate that maybe it's due to Albuquerque's mountainous terrain that maybe it pushed the jet stream upwards, but we're not entirely sure. But moving on from the irregular ascension, uh, we also need to answer the question on what caused so much damage to our ventilation system. We have bounced many theories off of one another uh, one of which I believe is uh, things became to become a lot more tangled when they hit that uh, updraft in the troposphere, which when the balloon bursted at that uh, very high altitude, everything started crashing into one another at its most vulnerable state. The ventilation system becomes very brittle uh, at the colder temperatures of the higher uh, stratosphere. But we unfortunately have no, uh, no way or no footage to confirm this theory because uh, very little actually did survive this launch. However, we do see the clean shear at the base of the nozzle, uh, which we believe happened because it was very brittle. And we could not actually find the neck of the nozzle either or the 360 degree camera, or um, we were missing something else, I'm sorry. We were missing a lot of things. And so we believe that all of this happened, did happen at altitude and, and not because of a rough landing. Uh, so what's next, right? Well, the EMU team has numerous plans and ideas before the next big launch on April 8th. Uh, zeroing in on just the ventilation system, we plan to add like two layers of epoxy to sort of act as like a shield um, or like a sealant. We also want to try to change the way the filament is printed at the base of the neck. And we also want to try different sizes of filament. Um, after each of these adjustments, we want to expose it to dry ice, uh, maybe test it in colder temperatures and sort of set up like tension lines to test structural integrity and test it in uh, nasty weather conditions, windy days. We just wanna be prepared for anything. So thank you all again so much for listening uh, to this talk and thank you for this opportunity and that's it. Okay, thank you, Jacob. Thank you for hopping in just a bit early and uh...